I think it's just started with the screening. You are the president of Ayora. You are also the <laughs> one of the very important persons in the World Congress of Anesthesiologists that's coming up. I know you are a very important member over there, as well as you have also contributed in the, the Regional Anesthesia Society in Japan. I remember you were elected president. So those are the things I remember offhand. And uh, sure, sorry madam. for that. And no, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you so <laughs> much. A lot. And of course, you're a very dear friend of ours. Please start your lecture on the role of regional blocks in acute trauma. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, good evening to all the friends who are part of this uh, scientific deliberation conducted by the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. I sincerely thank uh, Professor Radhakrishnan, Madam Jay Shri Sood, Dr. Sanish, for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts and views on a very important topic of great clinical relevance, the role of regional blocks and regional analgesia in acute trauma. I bring to you greetings from Ganga Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore. It's currently a 650-bedded tertiary care referral center for trauma, orthopedics, major reconstructive microvascular surgery, neurosurgery, facial maxillary surgery. Uh, we have progressed uh, from humble beginnings to having almost 36 operating theaters as of today. And we operate approximately 100 to 125 surgeries every day. And uh, the department also has grown over a period of time. We have about 80 anesthesiologists. And uh, uh, I'm very, very happy to say that since 2002, we made sure that anesthesiologists work as perioperative physician inside this hospital. Acute trauma is one of the leading reasons why a patient comes to a hospital. In India, currently the statistics indicate there is one trauma related death every three minutes. And for every death, there are about 10 injuries, which means in a period of 30 minutes, you will have close to 100 patients getting admitted to a hospital, some part of the country with an injury. So, it's a global problem, but more in India. And unfortunately, uh, it happens in the age group, which is very productive between the 25 to 50 years. And when they sustain an injury, one of the most important things that needs to be addressed is the significant pain that is associated with, uh, with trauma. And when they land up in your emergency room, they are not only have sustained injuries at, at various parts of the body, eliciting severe nociceptor stimulation, but many of them are also full stomach. And in this scenario, thanks to the advent of ultrasound and peripheral nerve stimulator, regional blocks seems to offer the solace to these people who are suffering. And most importantly, apart from being extremely effective, in producing good pain relief. It's also very, very cost effective. But as in any trauma, it's very important before we embark on the journey to do the block in a trauma victim, we should never forget the primary survey and resuscitation. They take the precedence of airway with spine, with the cervical spine control, breathing with ventilatory support, circulation with hemorrhage control, quick look at the disability, the neurological evaluation, specifically important if you're planning to institute a block, a pre-existing neurological injury due to trauma needs to be recorded and documented. And we need to completely undress the patient to see for any other hidden injuries. As we all know, the free nerve endings that are present in the body, the A delta fibers and the C fibers do the harm of transmitting the pain across uh, the central nervous system. The first pain that you get is a fast, sharp and well localized pain. It is due to the pain fibers, the A delta fibers. 
The second pain is because is much lower in onset, much duller, and often poorly localized is because of the C fibers. And you are all aware of this, that this is the pain pathway, and we can intervene at various places. Uh, at the site of injury by local infiltration or the peripheral nerve by using a peripheral nerve block, or it could be at the level of dorsal root ganglia, where you can either do local anesthetic, opioids, alpha-2 agonists, NMDA antagonists, and COX-2 inhibitors, or it can be centrally mediated. And we all know that the majority of the trauma patients may have associated injuries apart from limb injuries like chest, abdomen, brachial plexus, and peripheral nerve injuries. So when we embark on the journey of doing a regional block, it becomes pertinent that first we do the primary survey and resuscitation. Second, a very quick look at all the parts of the body, front and the back, to see for associated injuries. In whom do we institute peripheral nerve block? In all the upper extremities, hip and lower extremities, and now, we know that there are several new blocks which have emerged for treating chest injuries, spine injuries, and abdominal injuries. So you name that part of the body, and there is a block which is available now, which can be done effectively within a few minutes to make the patient extremely comfortable. The regional block seems to offer great advantage over systemic drugs because uh, it can be given to patients in full stomach, and then it doesn't alter the general body physiology or the internal milieu, which is already disturbed. And it does hardly produce any cardiovascular instability. And also we have seen that regional block, apart from acting as an instant analgesic on many occasions could also be the anesthesia for a procedure for which the patient is planned and also gives rise to excellent post-operative comp uh, post-operative compliance to the patient with least complication. The need for post-operative nursing becomes less because uh, of their uh, uh, excellent quality of pain release, ability to communicate, ability to ambulate, and it also helps us to facilitate easy transport. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss with you on what do we do as a team in the hospital. It was way back in 1999 that we introduced the concept of on arrival block. I remember my senior colleague, Dr. Ravindra Bhatt, who instituted this. This was not an era of ultrasound, but then he started the process by doing landmark technique, blocks and arrival, and made patients instantly pain free. Here you see a mutilated limb and he's doing a subclavian perivascular block for this patient. This is a picture that I took from the archive to show that what we do is more than two decades. And why is a nerve block better than any other form of pain management, especially the opioids in trauma? You know that opioids cause drowsiness and sometimes respiratory depression. And occasionally we will not be able to find out if the deterioration in the consciousness is due to the drug or due to associated secondary injuries like a brain injury. We do not know. But when you want to, when you completely avoid drugs which produces sedation in a polytrauma, and it's a very site specific analgesia, the neurology of the patient can be continuously monitored and we can pick up early neurological deterioration. So, and also it gives us a great opportunity to communicate with the patient. For example, if you get a severe, significant amputated injury like this, the patient is awake, but he's made pain-free surgery starts. During the uh, process of the surgery, we are able to talk to the patient and tell him about reconstruction and even get a consent in where situations where not possible, we tell them that we have to go for an amputation. So there seems to be several advantages apart from producing good pain relief uh, when you treat trauma patients with blocks. As I said, uh, beware of associated injuries. Now, I wanted to, uh, we all know it produces good pain relief, but how does it work? How have we made it work in our institution? So 24 hours 
there are anesthesiologists who are ready to give the block. This is number one. Number two, where do we do the block? Do we do the block in the emergency room or we do it in the, uh, the OR? So what we do, we have evolved a system that when the patient arrives into the emergency room, uh, if it's a small injury, then they go undergo investigations uh, and then come to the anesthesiologist. But Can I then can I? Then yeah. Hello, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have evolved a system that uh, the patient with trauma from the emergency room through an elevator directly comes to the operating theater complex, the ante room of the operation theater in the fourth floor is the one where we call it as the resuscitation room. Here on arrival, primary survey, resuscitation block is given and immediately taken for surgery. And there seems to be a great advantage of doing this. Number one, all that is needed for resuscitation is available in this ante room and all that is needed for investigations like the ultrasound machine, the x-ray machine, everything is available in the ante room. So the patient need not run around. In fact, all the investigations and the resources, human resources are in a single point, which will prevent for unnecessary transferring the patient from one place to the other. And we make sure that uh, we have an ultrasound machine all the time available throughout the year that instantly the block is administered. So when we wanted to implement a, a, a concept like this, the most important thing is the, the creation of infrastructure, including human resources, the machine and the paraphernalia, which is associated with, uh, with uh, making it possible. And slowly from one ultrasound machine, now we have gone to 12 ultrasound machines for the Department of Anesthesia. And uh, I just wanted to tell you, see the, the mangled extremity, but see the comfort of the patient. So this patient, uh, for example, when he comes inside, just imagine the Vasco and him, significant pain and uh, completely uh, mashed uh, uh, upper extremity. And the minute he comes, we hear you definitely know there is going to be neuro deficit because this is a, a runover injury. So on arrival, we get an informed consent. We follow aseptic and universal precautions to protect ourselves and the monitors are attached and this patient received a supraclavicular uh, brachial plexus block. With the advent of ultrasound, it's become easy to do a very effective quality of block with minimum volume of local anesthetic solution. So this is a simple block. This particular patient uh, received a subclavian perivascular block. You know, you see that's the first strip and you see that's the pleura and uh, you see the bunch of grapes here and that's a subclavian artery. So it's such an easy thing to visualize these structures and place about 10 to 15 ml of the drug here to produce within five minutes a very effective block when you get a patient with a significant injury. There seems to be much more uh, advantage than pain relief. This is, see, it's an open injury, patient was bleeding. You administer the block and you apply the tunique and inflate the tunique and stop the bleeding. Then, after the block has taken, only then we subject the patient to radiological examination because many times they need an AP view, a lateral view, an oblique view. And for the surgeon to reconstruct the skeletal uh, architecture would need all these views. Just imagine all these views are being done in an injury like this without producing analgesia. Imagine the amount of discomfort and pain the patient would have got but also imagine that he has got the block, the whole limb is numb, and now the X-ray radiologist is, radiographer is taking the pictures as you see here. So uh, 
uh, in the ante room or in the resuscitate room, we have the X-ray machines to get all this done. So this seems to give a, a better resolution X-rays and the surgeon is able to operate better. So uh, bilateral blocks. So we, when you get cases like this, uh, all the 10 fingers are amputated and they need a microvascular surgery. And the duration of the surgery in this patient lasted 17 hours. And all that the patient had was bilateral block. We, when we embark on doing a bilateral block, one side, it will be supraclavicular and the other side, it will be infraclavicular. As you all know, especially if there are students around, I wanted to tell when you get bilateral limb, upper limb injuries, do not do bilateral above clavicle blocks because of the fear of phrenic getting involved and diaphragmatic palsy and patient may go into respiratory arrest. So uh, it's not a contraindication to do a bilateral block, but on one side, it is above the clavicle. It could be either subclavian perivascular, interscaline. On other side, it could be infraclavicular, costoclavicular or axillary. So the infraclavicular, uh, whenever you uh, approach the brachial plexus by this method, you will, uh, the phrenic is spared. So this is a take home message I would want it to give to the youngsters who wanted to begin their practice when they get a bilateral injury. And uh, as I said, uh, we also do reconstructive microvascular surgery and there seems to be much more advantages than pain relief alone. When you have given a block and you wanted to re-implant an amputated limb, the results and the outcome is excellent because the chemical sympathectomy produced by the block prevents the vasospasm and the microcirculation after the anastomosis, the microcirculation becomes better. And uh, also because of the fact that uh, you produce excellent hemodynamic stability in this patient. And uh, because the patient is not under general anesthesia, there is no particular, I mean, patient does not keep losing the heat. He's awake, he's conscious, oriented, and his autonomic system is intact. So hypothermia is very less. If in long procedures, we have seen that adding dexamethasone as an adjuvant results in analgesia for as close to eight to 12 hours. And in case of needed, either you can go for a repeat block if the duration is a, the previous case, which I showed, was 17 hours, you can go for a repeat block, or if you want, you can go in for a continuous perineural infusions. There seems to be even much more advantages. For example, this is a, a slide which I've preserved for years to tell the young minds that the advantages of regional anesthesia. For example, this patient came with an amputation. He was given a block and the uh, anastomosis was done, microsurgery was done, and the limb uh, was replanted again. And the patient was conscious throughout. But the minute the replant was done, you see the patient suddenly who was conscious became semi-conscious, becoming moving towards unconsciousness, profusely sweating. And this uh, is associated with what you see in the, um, in the ECG, uh, tall T waves and uh, a tachycardia. So immediately after the amputation, the T waves subsided, I mean, came back to normal. In other words, uh, when you do it under regional block, you are able to identify the reperfusion injury that uh, happens in the patient. And it also gives us an idea that the life is more important than the limb. In this particular patient, we again amputated him and saved the life because the reperfusion injury can be catastrophic. In, my, in our initial days of trauma care, we thought we'll be heroic in correcting the acidosis and the potassium levels, but later we realized that the myoglobinuria and rhabdomyolysis that happens takes away the patient from us and they go into acute renal shutdown. I just spoke about the bilateral blocks. I, uh, I just wanted to let you know we do it uh, very often and see uh, just a bilateral uh, hand surgery going on, the microvascular surgery. And uh, when we have uh, to do an upper limb and a lower limb with a polytrauma situation, we again don't opt for uh, general anesthesia as far as possible. 
uh, we go for an upper extremity block and the lower either a peripheral nerve block a lumbar and sacral plexus block or a peri or a neural neuraxial block of spinal and epidural now the next important thing which i would wanted to share with you is uh, um, the time duration between arrival of the patient converting them into taking into the operating room is the is minimum uh, when you do it with regional block it's both analgesia and anesthesia so on patient can be shifted to the table immediately now we you saw several slides on the upper limb in lower limb uh, you know that uh, the geriatric population in this country the third most common cause for which they come to a hospital is a hip fracture it could be a trochanter or neck of femur so we have evolved a system that irrespective of what time they arrive into the hospital every hip fracture gets a block immediately on arrival so uh, an anesthesiologist is available to do this block all the time again this is done in the ante room of the operating theater where all that is required for resuscitation is available now what block do we do initially when we started we used femoral block later we moved on and tried few other blocks like the um, the fascia iliaca block the supraingvinal fascia iliaca block and now we have found out that ping block the pericapsular block seems to be the most ideal uh, block for patients who come with hip fractures the it's very efficacious and when you add 4 mg dexamethasone the duration of analgesia lasts for 18 sometimes to 24 hours so uh, the hip fractures are dealt with femoral block and uh, one more thing which suppose the hip fracture you you are planning to operate immediately or the next day even though we have given an honorable block the next day when he comes to the operating room assess his pain and if he is still having discomfort on movement we repeat the block and then only positioning position him for a neuraxial block the advantage seems to be number one is the patient comfort number two you can position the patient appropriately to deliver a neuraxial block when you deal with fractures below the knee joint uh, which is completely the lumbosacral plexus or the sciatic distribution for example open ankle injuries so you go for a sciatic block and you can do it anywhere subgluteal sciatic down to popliteal sciatic and a note of caution is when you deal with proximal tibia fracture this is one condition where we we are a bit shy in doing a block because this particular place they are highly prone for compartment syndrome and in case if you have administered the block and you fail to monitor the patient some of these patients may go in for acute compartment syndrome producing both neurovascular deficit and sometimes needing an amputation so this is another take home message i want to give to all the youngsters whenever you deal with a proximal tibia fracture i would request you uh, to shy away from a block or if you decide to do a block this patient has to be closely monitored for the possible development of compartment syndrome on occasional cases where there is a um, knee dislocation with the proximal tibia acute severe pain if we decide to administer the block this patient is never shifted to the ward he is in the high dependency unit the pulse oximeter probe is connected to the lower limb and continuously we look for the pulse wave form or repeated doppler studies to make sure that you detect a compartment syndrome if it happens much early to prevent a limb loss the other group of individuals who benefit tremendously from regional analgesia are those who come with thoracic injuries especially fractured ribs plyel chest they remarkably do well if they given an analgesia if you don't all these patients breathe less because of the severe pain associated with every inspiration and if they don't breathe well over a period of time they develop atelectasis superadded infection and some of them go into ards so in trip fractures most of the times they also have an associated injury to the lung parenchyma i think analgesia seems to be the way out to make them 
recoup from the injury faster and the lung to expand faster by doing good incentive spirometry. So what are all the things that we do? Initially, we started with thoracic epidural, then we went to thoracic paravertebral block, and now we have found out erector spinae block to be very effective, simple, can be administered even by the first year postgraduate, and when you add dexamethasone, the duration of analgesia is close to 18 to 24 hours, as I mentioned. And sometimes uh, when you can't turn the patient and the patient has got fracture of the anterior ribs, one of the best blocks to do is serratus anterior plane block. Again, extremely easy, very effective, can be done even by a, by a first year postgraduate. So uh, thoracic injuries uh, make the pa uh, adequate pain relief in thoracic injuries make the patient do excellent incentive spirometry and we can charge them much faster. So uh, controversies uh, that are associated uh, with uh, regional blocks are acute compartment syndrome. And before I uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, the com controversies, the new blocks uh, for abdominal injuries, for example, blunt trauma abdomen, and whenever you have done a laparotomy, uh, when you have done it under general anesthesia, before you extubate the patient, it's a great idea to go for play, you go for abdominal blocks. You can do uh, the tab block. If you do tab block, it has to be a combination of lateral tap with subcostal tap, or you can go for the quadratus lumborum block, extremely effective. Uh, and also uh, you can embark on the journey of erector spinae block. Erector spinae block uh, is very controversial. It's a new interfacial plane block which has come into work. The advantage is it's easy to perform and uh, it can be done by uh, the youngsters and the juniors. There are no major vessels that are associated. You need not worry about whether the patient was an antiplatelets or anticoagulation. So, uh, and uh, it blocks when, when it is given in a volume of about 20 ml, it blocks both the anterior, uh, both the ventral ramae and the dorsal ramae and uh, the pain relief even in the anterior portion like lap laparotomy is extremely good. So uh, the concept of dealing with, uh, uh, with the uh, cavity injuries like thoracic and the abdominal has completely changed. And now we have also embarked into the journey of sacral fractures and uh, fractures which has involved a coccyx. Uh, we have gone in for uh, ESP sacral block. And so you can block the ESP right from the cervical level up to the sacral level to produce an excellent effective pain relief uh, in your patients. So coming back uh, to the controversies of regional blocks that needs to be administered uh, uh, in acute trauma, I discussed already about acute compartment syndrome to be kept in mind. And this, I said, is very, very common only with certain kind of fracture. One of them is proximal tibia. The other one is a limb which is highly contused, where the soft tissues are highly inch and it's a closed compartment and soft injury is there. For example, a limb which goes into um, a machine and comes out. So these injuries, when you do a block, you need to closely monitor them for compartment syndrome. And uh, as I told earlier, a pre-existing nerve injury in trauma has to be recorded. In our institution, what we do is we take the photographs of the injured limb and we paste it in the case sheet. And we also record the nerve injury. So it, later, it's, it's a great document when the relatives come and ask. Because if in trauma, many times you don't have any, anybody associated with the patient present at the time of uh, uh, resuscitation and surgery. Most of the time, 108 ambulance brings them and leaves and goes. There is nobody to sign uh, the consent. But it's been a policy of the institution that um, we don't ask for anything. All that we do is we send uh, a note uh, as an unknown, if he's an unknown, to the police station, and we start the process of resuscitation and doing all that is needed, including blood transfusion. Because there is no time. You can't wait for someone known to come to sign the consent. It will be too late. They will not be able to see the patient in the ward or the intensive care unit. If we wait for that, they will have to go and take the patient in the mortuary. So it's been the policy of our institution 
uh, that we go ahead and uh, do all that is needed to, to save the patient uh, when he's injured. And hence, it becomes important we document all that we are doing. And so we have a department which, which takes the photographs and stores it. It's all, all the records are in the hospital information system that it can be retrieved at any time and shown to all concerned, whether it is legal or whether it is patient relatives. A lot of caution when you deal with major trauma patient who had associated reasons to have anticoagulants. And as you all know that uh, INR of less than 1.5 is fine, but if it's more than 1.5, still we go ahead and make them, uh, uh, the pain relief offer them, but we choose uh, blocks which are not deeper. Uh, we choose blocks where uh, you do it in ultrasound, a senior does it, you do a scout scan, see if there are any intervening vessels in the journey of your needle and do an appropriate block without injuring the vessels. And uh, I spoke about the acute compartment syndrome. If you have not noticed, and uh, this, is, uh, this is what happens, uh, that we, they need a fasciotomy. But whenever you see, this is the approximal tibia fracture. You see um, uh, how the, the color of the skin changes and then the compartments. And this is a picture just to show how it looks, the, the compartment swelling, and you need to go for a fasciotomy. And uh, actually, um, I would want it to feel uh, that um, this needs a lot of dedication uh, because uh, you need to have an anesthesiologist uh, around to do the block. Now, slowly, uh, the emergency physicians have also started uh, embarking into the journey of uh, doing the blocks in the emergency department. Uh, it's good. Uh, and. Uh, one of the things that we need to keep in mind uh, when we do these blocks on arrival is the possible development of local anesthetic systemic toxicity, uh, which can happen when the volume exceeds or inadvertent placement of the drug into the vessel. In a patient who is already, already having compromised uh, cardiorespiratory system, uh, a last will be the last thing that you want to have. However, uh, in uh, appropriately trained use of ultrasound uh, with uh, a minimal effective volume, the chances of developing uh, or producing a local anesthetic systemic toxicity is extremely rare. However, uh, it is important that however small the injury is, if you embark on doing a block, never do it without having an IV access. Never do in a place where you don't have an oxygen source or a suction machine, or you have drugs like di like uh, midazolam or uh, pentothal available to treat the convulsions associated with uh, local anesthetic toxicity. Also, intralipid has to be ready in all the centers which do this block uh, in, in large volumes, or even if they do small volumes, it's pertinent that they store at least two vials of intralipid because this seems to be the savior if, when you develop a local anesthetic toxicity. So the take home message is as anesthesiologist, as we are equipped with the skill and the knowledge to block the nerve at various parts of the body with the help of it, with the ultrasound, it becomes easy to make the patient pain-free instantly and it is so gratifying to see the patient who was crying and howling, starting to smile at you and making them completely pain-free. But before embarking on this, you need to make sure that your primary survey is done. The process of resuscitation goes side by side. And after which you give a very site-specific effective analgesia and immediately shift to resuscitative surgeries if needed. And you also know that this becomes an regional block, becomes an excellent component of the multimodal post-operative analgesia. And we have found out its uh, use has improved the outcome, both the pulmonary morbidity, patients develop least chronic pain syndrome and the post-traumatic stress disorder, which are associated with significant pain all could be avoided by uh, giving the block. There are a lot of studies and literature to show 
if acute pain is not treated well, the nociceptor continuously keep bombarding the dorsal horn. And in the process, there are new excitatory, neuro excitatory pathways which develop and their patient starts developing chronic pain syndrome, which becomes very, very difficult to treat later on. So one of the ways to prevent the development of chronic pain syndrome is to do an effective acute, uh, uh, in acute trauma is to do uh, an instant block. And the, in India, a country like India, where we speak a lot about the economy and the cost of the patient, there cannot be anything more effective than a nerve block for the, uh, for the amount of analgesia that it produces. So um, not only this, uh, on many occasions, uh, this has been a savior for us. For example, patients coming with acute shoulder dislocation, elbow dislocation, hip dislocation, knee dislocation, fully inebriated uh, alcohol because of alcohol, full stomach, vomiting, but having acute pain. And some of them have, because of the pain, have such significant increase in their uh, blood pressures. So I've seen pressures like 240, 140 in a patient who is not in hypertensive because of the excruciating pain, which is associated with dislocations. And it becomes pertinent that you do miracle by just instituting some drug into that brachial plexus or into the lumbar plexus or lumbosacral plexus, make them pain-free and go in for a reduction. And believe me, within 10 minutes, the scenario changes. And especially when you're confronted with situations where it's difficult to intubate because full stomach, vomiting, the, the regional blocks really comes to a rescue. And what would have been a nightmare for you is converted into a happy and joyous uh, occasion because of the capability and because of the availability of the infrastructure to institute a block. So I look forward for a day when every single patient who comes to the hospital, any part of this country, gets a block on arrival. I'm very happy to say the government of Tamil Nadu has uh, constituted a committee now to make sure all the government hospitals uh, in the state uh, will be provided with the ultrasound machine and the expertise to do the on arrival block. And I'm very happy to share again Yesterday, in Tutukudi Medical College, it's one of the small peripheral medical colleges in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, I just saw pictures coming in from the emergency department. There's a young boy with fractured femur. Uh, they have done an ultrasound guided femoral block and then applied a Thomas splint. So this is the way forward. And I am 100% sure the Indian College of Anesthesiologists will uh, act in all the institutions where it has got to say that uh, uh, these uh, on arrival block in acute trauma would become a, a norm and will completely change uh, the way the trauma victims suffer, both acute uh, outcome as well as chronic outcome. Both seems to be uh, uh, very, very welcoming when you institute these blocks. I take this opportunity to thank our entire uh, department of anesthesia and the surgical team. They work in live, in close nexus. It's a teamwork. And together, we made it possible that uh, all the surgeons allow the blocks to be administered. So I need to thank our surgical department for giving a free hand to institute this block uh, in all the patients. And collectively, we have been able to offer the best possible solution to our patients. Sincere thanks for the opportunity. I, I look forward um, uh, for any questions or uh, uh, any uh, queries regarding uh, the points which I shared with all of you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Radha Krishnan sir, Jai Shri Sud, Madam, uh, and Dr. Sanish. Thank you, Dr. Balavangit, for the excellent lecture you gave. It was a master class lecture. We are grateful that you were able to be with us and do this particular lecture. Once again proves that you are one of the best orators of the country. I am sorry I was not there at the beginning to introduce you and my colleague Dr. Jayashri has introduced you. Thank you Dr. Jayashri for that particular intervention. 
because I was out with you know electricity for a while. But anyway, you came back and I am with you now. Voila. Well, you are telling your experience of the last two and a half decades on the trauma management. And I know you are advocating honorable block all these days and because I had been hearing at least for two decades about the own arrival blocks from you. Do you have any particular suggestion regarding the drug combination? Or do you like a multimodal approach at the own arrival? Um, so, uh, so that's a good question. And uh, with the advent of ultrasound, uh, we have been able to deposit the drug very close to the neural tissues. And for the analgesia purpose, uh, either you can, for single shot block, there is not much difference between bupivacaine versus ropivacaine because always it is felt ropivacaine is more cardio stable than bupivacaine, but not in the doses that we administer for single shot injection. So I would rate both of them equal. So what percentage do you use? If it is going to be for analgesia purpose, I would prefer 0.25% bupivacaine or 0.2% ropivacaine. But if I want to produce both analgesia and anesthesia, I would go for 0.5% bupivacaine or 0.5% uh, ropivacaine. So that would be my choice. When you deal with dislocations, whom you want to send them home immediately, and there is no need to have the analgesia for a long time, you can. Uh, choose to use uh, lignocaine uh, with adrenaline 2% uh, for uh, these patients because it's a very small procedure and uh, the patient recoups and they get discharged faster. So these are the three drugs which we use uh, in our institution. Apart from the local anesthetic combinations, do you go for any other drug other than dexamethasone? Dexamethasone, you said you like dexamethasone and uh, sir, uh, and most yeah. of the occasions. Eh? The adjuvants, uh, the safest adjuvant in trauma seems to be dexamethasone for several reasons. Number one, it, uh, as I said, it really prolongs the duration of surgical anesthesia and analgesia. And uh, it also acts as an anti-inflammatory effect, as a component of multimodal analgesia, and also as a component of post-operative nausea vomiting. So if I want to choose one drug as an adjuvant, my choice is uh, dexamethasone. And more importantly, it's cardiostable. Unlike uh, the alpha-2 agonists like dexmed and clonidin, uh, which have got its own effect on the uh, heart rate and the blood pressure. In short, you don't want to touch on narcotics of any type. Uh, sir, I would, uh, I, would, I would prefer the current evidence with all the, uh, uh, the large uh, randomized control trials on adjuvant, the best emerged drug <coughs> is dexamethasone. There seems to be no clear uh, role for fentanyl <coughs> sorry, sir, uh, yeah. as an adjuvant to perineural uh, local anesthetic solution. But to a large extent, well, I know your experience of the last two decades, you are <laughs> explained to us. Eh? But as a routine ex exposition of the mat is going around, eh? because I keep seeing people mixing up with your fentanyl and giving the block, especially for the plexus block, as well as for subarachnoid, epidural, all these particular conventional blocks. Eh? But my question is slightly different eh? because you are rather telling about the honorable block. And your honorable block sometimes being carried to the operating rooms and goes for some 16, 18 hours. How are you going to manage your honorable block for such a long time? Are you going to put the cathedral straight at the beginning itself? Or are you going to have an elective placement of a cathedral later? Uh, sir, I would prefer uh, going in for single shot blocks to start with because uh, we may have to do several things uh, when you manage a trauma victim. So we wouldn't waste time in uh, inserting a catheter, looking for it. So it's much more easier to do a single shot block. And later, if it warrants, uh, then you can go electively for a, a catheter later on. And regarding the fentanyl, the current evidence is intrathecal fentanyl. Definitely there seems to be 
um, uh, large studies which say that it do, does prolong the effect of surgical anesthesia and the recommendations are clear. But as far as perineural uh, fentanyl is concerned, as of today, there is no evidence to show that they prolong the duration of the block. All its effect is because it gets systemically absorbed and patient may become more comfortable and quiet. So um, these are the current studies uh, very clearly mentions uh, uh, of, the, of the opioids. There is one opioid which seems to be uh, good perineurally and that is buprenorphine. Uh, even in, in the peripheral nerve blocks. So that opioid has been found to be very effective in prolonging the duration. So as of today, it's dexamethasone, buprenorphine, and dexmedomidin are the three clear adjuvants uh, uh, which uh, seem to be of great help. So in short, you people don't want to bring in any of the drugs like here. Dexmedetermidin, or say tramadol, or say all the available narcotics in the country mixed with local anesthetics and being given for perineural blocks or for epidural or subarachnoid. Uh, so, so for epidural, uh, as I said, for neuraxial, there is evidence, but not for perineural, sir. Not for perineural. So what is the maximum volume you will give in a period of 18 hours to 24 hours? Um, That's so this is, difficult. Yeah, I this know is, it. yeah, this is a very nice question. Yeah. And also, uh, I wanted to uh, open up certain thoughts uh, on this particular topic. We decided for ages, we have been talking about 2 milligram per kg body weight, 4 milligram per kg body weight, 6 milligram per kg body weight. But... How did we arrive at this dose? If we go into the articles, it was majority of the time, it was the placement of the drug epidurally in human volunteers and the plasma levels of the drug were measured. And that's based on that, they came to this particular uh, milligram per kg body weight for xylocaine, adrenaline, bupivacaine, ropivacaine. However, the rate of absorption of the local anesthetic solution from different tissues in the body into the systemic circulation is very different. If you compare the rate of absorption of the local anesthetic from the epidural space versus placed in the brachial plexus, the rate of absorption in the brachial plexus region is close to one tenth of what it is absorbed epidurally. So, if you actually extrapolate, it is very clear that the, the toxic dose, what we are talking about, directly is proportional to the rate of absorption. In other words, in when you deal with conditions like this, if you are not intravascular, placing more milligram per kg body weight, if you think it's going to be an advantage in producing excellent pain relief under monitored anesthesia care, my experience shows that you can possibly inject more milligram per kg body weight, especially when it's done with ultrasound. And as I said, that you will be very careful that you're not putting it into a vascular system directly. So I would want uh, for those who want to learn more about this particular aspect of regional anesthesia, there is a chapter in the Admir Hadzik textbook of regional anesthesia on the, a study on the rate of absorption of the drug from different parts of the body into systemic circulation. Thank you, Bala. Your talk has really inspired us in most of the areas. I request Sanesh, if there are any questions in the chat box, Will you allow the particular originator of the question to talk directly to Bala Vangid and clarify? Okay, sir. Actually, there are not much questions in the chat except for one uh, query on how to how give repeat block and uh, how to mix two local anesthetics together. If anybody is interested to um, put questions directly, just uh, raise your hand. Where you won't get chance every time. You can now 
Kodai will allow you to directly converse with Dr. Bala Venkat and get an answer. Yes, I think... Uh... Two participants raise hand. Okay, yes. please. Unmute yeah. them, please. Uh, okay, Rajesh, you can go ahead. Hello. Hello. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, sir, for nice presentation, sir. Sir, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, in case there is no availability of ultrasonography, then how, what should be the, uh, what should we do? Like till the time it's available all over the India. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I would like to tell you that, uh, do you have a peripheral nerve stimulator with you? Yes, sir. Okay. So peripheral nerve stimulator effectively can do uh, the job of ultrasound in, in blocks like interscaline, subclavian perivascular, infraclavicular, axillary, femoral, sciatic. Uh, so uh, you will not be uh, having any issues in dealing with extremity blocks uh, uh, with a peripheral nerve stimulator. You can give it very effectively and efficiently. And uh, uh, occasionally, uh, there are also people who, with landmark techniques, do excellent uh, block. Uh, so it just needs that uh, you need to know the anatomy very well. And until you get an ultrasound machine, you cannot allow your patient to suffer from pain with a peripheral nerve stimulator. Effectively, you can do most of the blocks except for interfacial plane blocks. And sir, uh, how to assess now injury, especially in crushed injuries, like what should we you do? You can't. You can't assess uh, until uh, you are provided, especially if you had seen the pictures that I've shown. Uh, if it's a grossly mutilated, everyone understands. Uh, everyone understands that uh, there is going to be involvement of the neurovascular bundle. So you just have to get a consent and you need to tell them that uh, only after providing pain relief, we will be able to actually assess the amount of neurological injury. And that's why we all the time we take pictures and store it so that later there is no confrontation. And the patient is also explained clearly about this. Thank you, sir. Okay, Dr. Sabari, please. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Thank you for your excellent uh, presentation, sir. I have two doubts. Yeah. Uh, sir, can, in, uh, for example, in upper lip blocks, is it uh, rational to mix two local anesthetic, for example, lignocaine with adrenaline uh, along with uh, bupuacin for the faster act action of the blocks? Uh, actually, um, uh, I personally feel that after the advent of ultrasound, things have changed. Because if you are able to place the drug very close to the nervous tissue, even with bupivacaine and rupivacaine, the onset is very fast. But when you do with peripheral nerve stimulator, when you do not know the uh, distance between the needle and the nerve, I still feel it's a good idea and there is no contraindication of mixing uh, lignocaine adrenaline and with bupivacaine. I've also experienced it that the rate of onset of the block is faster. And for me, when you use a peripheral nerve stimulator, mixing lignocaine adrenaline uh, shows, uh, gives one more benefit. Uh, like when I was doing, when we were not using uh, ultrasound, when we were doing with only peripheral nerve stimulator on arrival block, mandatory, it was my mandatory uh, requirement to add lignocaine adrenaline because there you do not know, you are not seeing whether there is a vessel or not. It's only uh, you aspirate every three ml and inject the drug. But many times, you know, in spite of negative aspiration, the tip of the needle could be in, in the vicinity of the vein or into the vein. So my marker was the adrenaline that is present in lignocaine. So I will, the, my teaching to all my postgraduate students 15 years ago was always when you use a peripheral nerve stimulator, use lignocaine with adrenaline along with other local anesthetic if you want to. Now note the heart rate before you start the block. And suddenly, if you see there is a rate of rise in the heart rate of more than 15 beats until proved otherwise, it is intravascular placement of the drug and you stop injecting the drug. So uh, in the intravascular, it used to be an intravascular marker. So two purpose, one is increased rate of onset of the block and number two, 
to identify uh, the intravascular placement of the drug. Thank you, sir. My second question is, uh, what will be the percentage of uh, ropuacin to be used for the surgical anesthesia of the blocks? Uh, so it differs, uh, it depends uh, between 0.5 to 0.75. Uh, these are the two uh, percentages uh, that we use. And uh, for me, uh, again, uh, it's my personal choice. Um, in single shot blocks, I prefer using bupivacain over ropivacain. And uh, for anesthesia, I use 0.5 and analgesia, I use 0.25. The reason being uh, the duration of the block and the cost uh, when you compare bupivacain versus ropivacain, bupivacain is much lesser. And in single shot block, the chances of cardiotoxicity that we speak a lot about doesn't exist. So my choice is bupivacain, but the, for the question that you asked is 0.5 and 0.75 percent ropivacain. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sabiri. I think uh, one more question like from uh, Dr. Nikila, yeah. other than dexamethasone, dexmed and uh, buprenorphine, what other drug can be used to prolong the duration of block? I was telling that uh, in a trauma situation, uh, I strongly advocate uh, using uh, dexamethasone and uh, because uh, dexmethasone, because of your cardiovascular implications, my drug of choice will be dexamethasone. And since it's freely available and it's uh, economical, I, I recommend that as the first, second and third option as an adjuvant. So in short, the option of using small amount of narcotics mixed with the local anesthetic is probably going to cease in three, four years time. Once ultrasound, GERDA, regional box is going to get more popular and other become universal. Sir, uh, perineurally, uh, there is no strong evidence to show that uh, it enhances the blocks. Perineurally, yeah. Any further questions from anybody? Thank you, Bala. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity, sir. For I the hope, detailed uh, explanation. Uh, and hope, uh, I'm sorry uh, I was not there. Well, most of you know, Bala is a governing council member of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. I believe most of the people may be knowing. And moreover, he's a member of the World Federation Societies of Anesthesiologists Education Committee and these two positions he occupied. And he was one of the founder members of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Since he is not having that much of time to spare for Kolei also, he is not there with the Kolei activities. But now I believe he may be interested to come out to college and start giving us some really worth lectures, which are rather a treatise to all of us. Thank you, Bala, once again. You sure, proved you are a master class orator. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a true pleasure to be in this platform and share some of the things which we have been doing uh, for a few years. And uh, my sincere thanks to Dr. Sanish for coordinating so very nicely and Sud, Dr. Jayshri Sood, Madam, for the introduction. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank well, you very much. Yeah. Sir, uh, we'll move ahead. Yeah, to yeah, we'll move on to the next part. Session. Session. Well, as we explained in our program, this is a two part session. The first part of the session is over. First part of the session was a masterclass lecture that is delivered by Dr. 